So as we've been going through the stock market crash, we had many things that the media put up, especially JP Morgan and those people, to kind of try to spread up misinformation and to get retail investors to buy in so they can offload their position, so they can make commission on you, and they basically want you to react. And I've seen so many stories of false hope, like for example, the investor sentiment, people are too bearish, and I've been hearing that since 4100. Or you know, the other one was, uh, you know, that there's a lot of cash sitting on the sideline. But they show that every month, and every month will pretty much go lower. Why? Because those rallies that we're having are not on any fundamental type of basis. And the latest one that got a lot of people to buy was a Fed pivot, which I said there was no Fed pivot. And a lot of investors are starting to realize that. And many of them were waiting for the Fed pivot that whenever the Fed pivots, stocks go up and everything is fine. So this is why I made a video and I said why the stock market won't bottom from a Fed pivot and I kind of refer to the video that me and Kevin said. It was around 3700 I believe he said you know we're close to a pivot and then the Fed pivots we go we rally and everything is fine. Now <laughs> I don't really know if he actually watched my video or not. But he actually made a new video and corrected his mistake and he said the Fed pivot and the mega 50%. And he's basically talking about that the market crashes even after the Fed pivot on average, which is the correct story. And I'm happy that we're all kind of getting together and correcting those type of information so we don't really mislead people in the wrong uh, direction. But to give you my update on the market crash, to me personally the market looks very very weak. Again, I'm not a technical analyst expert by any chance whatsoever, but I look at a basic 200 day moving average on the weekly and you could actually see how weak the market is. This yellow line, which was the 200 day moving average, it actually holds up some pretty good support actually throughout the years as you could see in 2018, as you saw in 2016. It only broke it pretty much in March of 2020 when we had the big COVID crash and now the market broke it again when we went to 3400. So that to me shows me that there's pretty much no support for the stock market, maybe a little bit somewhere on a, the double bottom of 3200, but I cannot see really, really see any kind of support for the S&P 500. And I personally think the market is very, very weak and we're getting more and more volatile. The VIX is going higher as we're going lower in the stock market uh, crash. But what I really want to focus on, and this is again something that a lot of people are not paying attention to, and this is the whole thing with the S&P 500's earnings. I think the earnings for the S&P are very, very bullish, meaning on the high side. The estimate now is 235, and I believe this is very high, and I'm gonna tell you why in this uh, video. Now, this is the first thing that a lot of people are not talking about. 40% of the S&P's revenue comes on international and 60% is domestic, okay? Now, we know what we have in the United States. We have problems, a little bit of problems with energy, nothing like Europe, but we have some energy challenges, we have high inflation, we have higher wages, but they are not as high as, you know, inflation is, which is really squeezing consumers. They are borrowing on credit cards, credit card, uh, the interest is high on the debt, and they will likely not be able to keep piling up on the buy now, pay later, and credit cards, and it's eventually going to lead to something bad. This is what we have in the United States. But no matter how much bad stuff we have inside the United States, it's two or three times worse outside the United States. And this is makes up 40% of the S&P uh, 500's revenue. And I believe those estimates of 235 is like saying, you know, everything will go back to normal in 2023. And I don't believe this is going to uh, happen. Now, looking at something pretty interesting this year, we had a lot of volatility in the Forex uh, market, and we had a lot of devaluation of currencies in those countries. For example, the Chinese Yuan is down around 12% year to date. The Euro against the dollar is down 13.5%. The British Pound against the dollar is down 17%. And of course, you have the popular Japanese Yen, which is down 22.5% against the dollar year to date. Now that basically means that that 40% that's international, let's assume someone is in Japan and they want to buy anything 
in U.S. goods from companies in U.S. dollars. Now it's going to cost them 22% more just because their currency went down. And this is causing a lot of demand destruction from those people in, in their countries that want to buy anything in U.S. goods. So this is going to affect earnings. But not only is they have a depreciating currency, they also have an energy crisis in terms of Europe or the UK. For example, in the UK, the record daily average of about 500 pounds for electricity, or $590 uh, early this week, roughly five times the level of last uh, August. And this is in the UK. Many of you that watch me live in the UK, and you could actually tell me if this is accurate or not. But I believe it's accurate, and Europe is not better off as I've been, you know, seeing in the statistics and stuff. So not only is our currency went down, which causes demand destruction, but more demand destruction is coming from high inflation that's going to squeeze those people over there. Those are the two things I'm bearish on with international earnings. The third thing that I'm bearish on, and I said that on Twitter, we just seen it pretty much from uh, Netflix. And Netflix said for the Q4 of 2022, we're expecting revenue of 7.8 billion, a sequential decline entirely due to the continuing strength of the US dollar versus other currencies. On a constant currency basis, this equates to 9% growth. So they would have grown 9% if it wasn't from the dollar. And because of the dollar, they're going to decline in revenue. And the dollar is not going to go down anytime soon. All those countries, they are much worse off than us in the United States. And the Federal Reserve is not going to pivot anytime soon, which really means that those things are going to get worse. I mean, just imagine 9% growth has been wiped out just because of the currency exchange. I mean, just imagine how much this is affecting things. And people are not really thinking about it. And they are valuing the 2023 earnings estimate like, like we're just going back to normal, which is to me is beyond imagination, to be honest. This is one of those things. And one more thing I want to uh, talk about before I end this video, and it's something actually pretty funny that I was talking about with the people in my Discord group, which is within my Patreon, if you like to join us over there. And Coca-Cola, this is before, you know, it recovered a little bit, it started going down. And I told them Coca-Cola is the best short in the stock market. And they were all really surprised. And they told me, why do you think Coca-Cola is the best short in the stock market? I mean, that's, how could you bet against Coca-Cola? Well, this is because many people buy Coca-Cola, Johnson & Johnson, Procter & Gamble for safety and for some dividend income. This is just the way it is. They go to them for safety and they get a nice dividend. Okay. Now those dividends were attractive before two to 3%, whenever we had 0% interest rates. But now you have the 10 year at 4.1% and the five year, I believe it's around four and a half percent. So if you could, and the two year, the two year I'm, I'm saying is four and a half percent. So you could park your money in the government for two years or five years, even 10 years, get four to four and a half percent yield risk free. You're going to get it no matter what. So if you could do that with the bonds, with the U.S. government, why would you do it with Coca-Cola or Procter & Gamble or Johnson & Johnson? Which is why, in my opinion, their dividend yields have to go up, which is going to bring the share price down. And if we look at the dividend yield of the S&P 500, it's still 1.77%, which is much lower than, it's even lower than pre-COVID which is really not good at all. Now, I know uh, there's a lot of companies in the S&P that don't pay a dividend, but at the same time, this really shows you like how much lower it is than historical average of 4.5% as a dividend yield. And I believe this is also going to change. To, so to sum it all up, I am very bearish on earnings, mainly from the international segment. And even within the United States itself, I believe 235 is extremely on the high side for those estimates. My base case for the estimate is 200 EPS. And if I'm right on the 200 EPS and we get a 15 PE, which could even be on the high side with four and a half to 5% rates. But if we do get a 15 PE, this is 3000 on the S&P. 
Okay, this is how my calculations are. Now, if we get 200 and we get 14 PE, mainly from the uh, gross profit margins actually declining as we have more uh, kind of labor costs inflation and people ask for a higher wage in 2023, it's going to cause some, you know, some squeezing in margins. So if margins come down and we get a 14 PE, this is 2800 on the S&P 500 which is why I'm not really celebrating those rallies yet. And we could even maybe get under 200 EPS for the S&P. You know, on the average recession, you know, uh, earnings fall around 20%. So that would be around, you know, 185 or 180 EPS. And that would be really, really bad. But again, a base case of 200 would show you that we are not really close to a bottom on a fundamental basis. Not because the Fed is going to pivot on fundamentals. I don't believe we are fairly priced yet. So this is my video for today. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, please press the like button and maybe consider subscribing. So I hope to see you in another video.